Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Now, this is actually the fourth um, in, in a series of these type of forums. And one of the things that we noticed, and it's a little bit frustrating, I have to admit, where uh, you know people have sort of uh, either uh, misunderstanding of the way development and you know open space works, uh, or you know they're being fed you know misinformation, and you especially see it around uh, election time. And I actually saw a couple of uh, election flyers that were stunning in their inaccuracy. So uh, that kind of got me fired up to have this uh, forum right now to try and set the record straight, um, you know, as far as development, because it is one of the biggest issues that we deal with. Leaf removal, brush removal, and certainly development are the big three. And um, it's probably the, the least understood and the most complicated in a lot of ways. You know, the, uh, so much of what we do or what we can do here as far as development is really out of our hands. It's set by the state. Um, state municipal land use law is, is very uh, comprehensive and, and extensive, and it really governs everything we do here in, at the municipal level, at the county level, but certainly at the municipal level. So, uh, you know, so many times we'll get people coming up to us and say, uh, gee, you know, I see this, uh, they're building this here, uh, four ponds or whatever it is. Couldn't you just tell them no? Isn't there something you can do to stop that? Well, you know, it's not that simple and it's not that easy. And it's certainly, uh, you know, uh, something that we would like to have more control over, but the law is the law. So um, the good news is, and that's why I wanted to have this forum uh, tonight about open space, we've spoken a lot about redevelopment and development, uh, but not, um, not much about the other side of the equation. And uh, this is supposed to be an uplifting night, if you can believe that, uh, when you're talking about development. And uh, we've been very, very successful as far as open space. And uh, I thought it was a good idea to walk through exactly how that process works, because it is, it is a process, much the way development is. Uh, the township has uh, over 5,500 acres of permanently preserved open space, and that doesn't include conservation easements and things like that, uh, which you certainly bring it up a couple hundred acres, if not more, uh, over 6,000 acres. So uh, that's very impressive, and I don't think people realize the extent of what we have here. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Chris's Marina on West Front Street, uh, but there was a time when uh, one of the big de developers or builders was proposing several hundred townhouses on that site. Now, if you can imagine what West Front Street would be like going over that bridge with a couple of hundred townhouses or condos, I forget, Tony, what they are, uh, it, it would have been uh, a nightmare. Uh, but that's one of the success stories where we partnered with the, um, with the county and certainly Monmouth Conservation Foundation. I'm going to go through a few of the uh, other organizations who were involved in, in preservation and open space. And uh, we're able to permanently preserve it. And it's going to be a beautiful county park. And it's going to be a marina. And it's just going to be a, a show place. So that's one of the success stories. If anybody knows Bicentennial Park uh, by Burger King, they were proposing condos there at least 10 or 15 years ago. And I remember because I went up to one of, at one of the meetings and spoke out against it. And uh, now it's a park. So when somebody tells you, gee, the township isn't doing anything about development, they're just letting the developers run wild, I've heard that one a lot, uh, you know, it's important to keep these things in mind, that there have been a lot of successes. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have an endless pot of money to buy everything that we would like, but I think we've done a, a very commendable job with what we have to work with. Um, Middletown has an open space tax of its own, a municipal two-cent tax, which generates a little bit over $2.1 million each year. And um, that's the good news. The bad news is uh, the state owes us a little over a million and a half dollars. So for years and years, the money we were taking in from the open space tax was just about covering the debt service for properties we had purchased in the past. So we were just about breaking even and keeping our head above water. The bad news about that is we, don't ha we didn't have a lot of money to purchase new properties. We are now uh, almost paid off or, or paid off with some of those properties. So now we're building a little bit of a war chest, and now we're looking around to purchase more uh, uh, more open space, you know, as uh, reimbursements come in from the state, slow as they may be, we do get a little bit of money each year. Uh, some of the other uh, groups that we deal with, and Bill Cassidy, if you don't mind raising your hand, Bill, uh, from Mom, is the executive director of the Mammoth Conservation Foundation, who does a phenomenal job in the, in the county here, 
and they've been a great partner of ours, and they raise private funds uh, specifically for land preservation and open space uh, acquisitions. So uh, they've partnered with us on a number of projects around town. Uh, also, the Baykeepers Foundation is, is another organization that puts in money for open space. And uh, so between our open space uh, two-cent tax uh, organizations like Bills and, and Baykeeper, and also the county, uh, you may notice there was a, uh, there was a referendum this uh, past November, and I believe it almost doubled their uh, open space tax, which will uh, bring in another $17 million or something. So now, uh, you know, now we have the county with a bigger war chest to help us with. So uh, things are looking good. The downside is, uh, and I always use this analogy, it, you can't buy every property that comes on the market that you would love to buy. It's almost like having five of your kids fall overboard and you can only save one. And that's what it's like, what the position we're in. And there's a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there's enough you know, very desirable properties around uh, Middletown that we would love to purchase, uh, but we simply don't have the means uh, or the, uh, the funds to do it. And so we have to be very selective and make sure they're the best uh, purchased and, and the residents will get the most out of them. Um, you know, the other thing too with open space, uh, there is a cost to it. Uh, to maintain them. Uh, every park we have, we have some beautiful parks and some beautiful fields, but it, it really does take a lot of uh, manpower to maintain them the way we would like them maintained. So we have to walk that delicate balance without taking, uh, taking on more than we can possibly handle. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Tony because he's got, he put together a, a really, you know, fantastic PowerPoint. And one of the things I'm hoping everybody walks away with from here is, that, you know, that the town is doing a lot as much as humanly possible to expand open space and keep the quality of life that we all enjoy so much here. Uh, some of the limits that we're facing, uh, but also the successes that we've had here. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people, there may be a few people here, who don't even realize that Sandy Hook is actually a part of Middletown. So when you talk about open space, we have a national park. Uh, right in our, uh, in our midst here. So something that uh, we should all be very proud of and it certainly is part of our open space that so many people, millions of people, I think every year, uh, utilize. So uh, this is really a feel good forum here and everybody should walk out saying, gee, you know, we are uh, doing a good job and uh, we're looking to do more. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Mercantante, our uh, administrator. Thanks. Um, before I start with the slides, um, I thought, you know, I should explain. Some of the slides in here are, are the same as we've had in some of our prior presentations because we, we still, I think, need to address the, the development side of things and how that creates a pressure on, on open space and open space acquisition. But I'm going to go through them in a little bit more general sense than, I, than I've done in the past. If you want to see the more detailed one, look at the video that's now running on the, on the station, and that, that one goes into a little bit more depth. Um, so let's, we'll get started. So as the mayor mentioned, um, Sandy Hook is, a lot of people don't realize it's uh, a part of Middletown Township. Uh, how did that happen? Well, Middletown Township also included Highlands and Atlantic Highlands and a lot of other the municipalities around here, and historically they carved themselves off. But prior to those carving off, the federal government took jurisdiction of the peninsula we know as Sandy Hook, uh, and then those other municipalities became independent, so the Sandy Hook got sort of disconnected from Middletown, so that's kind of how it happened. But politically, if you want to look at it that way, it's part of Middletown Township. The residents who do live there are Middletown residents. They vote in Middletown. Um, they attend Middletown schools if there are, if there are children there. So it is it is Middletown Township proper. This is the question that we get faced with a lot. How could that happen? Why would you allow a development like that? There's already a lot of traffic on that road. How can you let another development get built and create more traffic? Um, and as as the mayor is mentioning. The process is really very structured. It's not uh, like there's a heck of a lot of discretion in the hands of the planning boards and zoning boards when they get an application. Because all towns are required to have a mass, uh, uh, all, to comply with the municipal land use law, which is a state law that covers the entire, entirety of New Jersey and sets forth the, the process to deal with land development applications. Uh, the master plan is, the, is kind of an overall guide for how things should go in the community, where things are, where things should be, where do we even want new things to go, uh, types of development, uh, including parks and recreation and open space. And um, then the zoning ordinances sort of put that into place. That's the local law. 
an ordinance is a local law, and, and it puts um, the concepts um, it, or the, the plans into place by actually adopting regulations and standards that apply to all portions of the township. So when the boards get an application to review for, for development, they basically are structured. They're structured in terms of how much time they have to review an application, how the notification process goes, how the public hearing process goes, how they have to take evidence, and listen to evidence. Uh, for example, boards can't take written evidence. A, a, a neighbor who might be concerned about a development can't write a letter and, the and have the board take that into consideration when reviewing an application. They have to physically be there because the theory is you got to be able to cross-examine. It's, it's handled a lot like a trial. Um, the process is handled a lot like a trial. Um, but if a person just writes a letter, a letter can't be cross-examined. So people have to be there. Um, it's important enough you need to be there if you're concerned about an application uh, near you. And, and the decisions have to be based upon that evidence and testimony that took place at the hearing. Um, and that's really all they can base a decision on. They can't really use extraneous factors or opinions. It really has to be based upon evidence. Um, I've just put in some slides here. Some of our parks, just to show you some examples of our, ours and county parks. This is Parsi Park. Again, it's um, one of the biggest parks in the township. It's mostly open space. There's a historic building um, on the property, and it's where our recreation offices are, and we have a nature center there as well that we run. And probably anyone who's gone to school in Middletown has taken the programs. Uh, their children have taken the programs at uh, Parsi Park. They do, they do a great job. We work with the Board of Education closely on those programs. So again, there's really no way to amend your ordinances to prevent development. You can control it and regulate it uh, to a large degree, but there's really no such thing as preventing it. People years ago in towns used to go, years ago used to do these things, um, you know, where, where they would do a blanket, you know, no development for the next five years. You can't do that anymore. Law this and allow it. Um, every property owner has a right to utilize their property in some reasonable fashion. Affordable housing is a significant issue because that's driven the majority of the development that's happened in the last 20 years. Uh, I'd say it's in the last 20 years, almost every housing development that's been built in Middletown and probably many other municipalities as well has had an affordable housing connection. Either it includes affordable housing or is a settlement to uh, prevent affordable housing from being on a property or it's uh, all affordable housing. Uh, the, the mandates under the state um, Mount Laurel rules um, has really been the driving force behind most residential development, certainly here and I think in many other places in the state. This is our um, affordable housing project list. And this, again, these goes, go back to probably about 1990 is the earliest, um, no, I'll take it back about 1999 uh, is the earliest of these projects. All these others have been um, built since then. But I can tell you, this, this, um, these unit, total number of units, it's over 1,600 units that have been built. And every one of them were built because there was a requ requirement to create some affordable housing. Okay? So it, it's a significant driving force. This is 630 affordable housing units. So for people who talk about communities who've been, you know, obstinate and not addressed their affordable housing obligations, we think we have. Uh, that's 630 units either built or approved to be built um, since about 1999. That's pretty good. Um, and um, this is a, but this is a significantly complex issue. Um, every one of these developments was painful to get processed and approved. The neighbors don't want these built, built anywhere near them. So it's a difficult process, and the township has taken a lot of slings and arrows whenever we've de developed these projects because people don't want them, but um, they're required. It's not really optional. If we had ignored the process and, you know, tried to dig our heels in, this 630 number could, could be a couple of thousand. Um, so that's the way you have to look at it. Uh, just another one of our parks. This is Thompson Park. This is a county park. Uh, on Newman Springs Road. So one of the things we talked about last time, and I think it's worth reiterating, is that there's a, there's a, a, a thought out there that there's been a lot of growth that's happened in the area. Um, 
And this will show you that it really has not, is not really the case. You can see that our population from the 60s, 70s to 80s into 1990 did grow at a fairly uh, decent pace. But you can see it's really tailed off. In fact, it's declined for Middletown. And even for the county, the, uh, not for the county, I'm sorry, but for the, the towns around Middletown that we can consider our neighbors, uh, our most immediate neighbors, um, the total number is actually down uh, from 2000 and barely more than uh, 1990. So if really for the last 30 years, there's not been a tremendous amount of growth that's happened here in terms of population. Uh, what has changed is the number of drivers, the number of cars. Every household, how many of you have a neighbor who's got four cars in their driveway? Probably everyone. Um, do they have four drivers? They might, but they might have four cars even without four drivers. But there are a lot more drivers in the homes as well. Nowadays, when you turn 16 and a half, you get a car. It wasn't the way when I was that age. You didn't automatically get a car. Now it's like a rite of passage. As soon as you're old enough, you get a car. So there's just more vehicles on the road. And that's really, you know, and people, people equate that to growth. All this new I'm in a traffic jam. It must be because there's a housing development that was just built down the road. It really isn't because of that. It's background factors. And this just shows it in more of a bar graph uh, format, but combined population for the, um, the municipalities that I, I referenced. Same thing with school district enrollment, although some diff differing factors here, but school district enrollment, as you can see, has really gone down pretty steadily since 2006 and 2007. Um, there certainly haven't been any years where there's a significant jump in uh, school population. It's really declining. It's probably for a multitude of factors, but probably the biggest factor being that people just don't have as many children as they used to. If you look at Middletown's last po uh, census data from um, 2010, of course, we're just getting ready to now do the 2020 uh, census. We're, we're already gearing up for that. But in 2010, our ho average household population was like 1.87. So that's, that, that most housing units aren't producing children. It's really a, a smaller percentage than people really realize that are producing school children. This is the park uh, the mayor is mentioning, Bicentennial Park. This goes from Route 35 all the way back to the pond on Spruce Drive, if you're familiar with that, the pond that's pretty much green all the time now. Um, but it's a great piece of open space, and that was developed, and it was, it was condo offices was what was being proposed to be built here. They were, it was one of the first proposals to do that kind of concept where you build little office spaces and they would be owned by the business or the doctor or whoever it was. That's what was being proposed here. But fortunately, we were able to negotiate um, and purchase the property. One of the drawbacks of purchasing a property, though, after there's a proposal to develop it, the price shoots up, right? Because the landowner's now already spent a half a million dollars on engineering and a couple hundred thousand dollars on attorneys, so they kind of ha you have to build that into the price. It's always better to be proactive and try to acquire properties without kind of a gun to your head. Um, but that, it isn't always the case. This is a slide that kind of shows you where our revenue comes from, um, uh, tax revenue, that is. And you can see that the driving um, force in property tax revenue is single family homes uh, or up to four units. But these, this would include condos. 78%, um, 197 million dollars um, from residential. That's, that's, that's the lion's share of the tax revenue that the township collects. And to keep in mind, the township collects that revenue and distributes it to the school, distributes it to the county, so everyone gets um, a piece of it. And these are th some of the other uses, and you can see they're, mu they're much smaller. Um, uh, farmland, obviously, uh, very low in terms of percentage. The next highest per uh, group is, is um, commercial property, and that's 8.4%, $21 million. So it's, it's um, a much smaller percent, but it's a really important component of the, um, the tax revenue equation because uh, what co the collection of revenue from uh, commercial does is it m minimizes the impact on residential. And every one of us who are residents here, that's what we care about most, our taxes keeping under control, not going um, skyrocketing. 
one of the ways to keep that from happening is that the commercial, um, the commercial tax base be stable, healthy. Um, that's why we were talking about in the prior discussions about economic development and redevelopment, about trying to do commercial development that is um, you know, viable and sustainable for a long period of time. It doesn't do us any good to have empty stores. You know, they pay less revenue when their stores are empty for a lengthy period of time. So um, we're, it's, it's to our benefit to have healthy commercial development. And some of that, of course, is market driven, right? So one of the biggest challenges we have is large corporate office spaces that in the 1980s were really, really popular. And we built millions of square feet of office space throughout the township. And many other towns up and down the park, Garden State Parkway did. Most of those buildings, or many of those buildings now, are in trouble. They're either empty or nearly empty. They're all filing tax appeals against their municipalities because they can't get the rents that they used to get. And every time we lose money on a tax appeal, the residents are picking up the, the tab. Um, it, so it's a, it's a fact of life. Um, but it's in our interest to start getting creative and smart about what we do with our commercial properties, our commercially zoned properties, to try to make them viable once again. And it's not an easy, um, an there's no easy answer to that. It's going to take a lot of, a variety of probably solutions to get to that answer. This just shows you how um, existing land use, this is actually existing developed land, um, how much of the township um, is divided up into different uh, uses. And so again, residential is the largest one. But still, only 39% of the township is developed residentially. Commercial properties tend to be bigger, um, but that's 6%. Um, par public parks and open space, though, is the next biggest percent. It's actually, pr uh, right now, it's probably a little closer to 16% now. Um, but it's a significant amount of, of parks and open space. And we, we're thankful to the county for, because they provide a lot. Um, this does not include um, Sandy Hook, by the way, in this calculation. If we did that, that number would be higher. Um, this is just township and, uh, and county. Um, now, a lot, of the, a lot of the farmland is uh, a house on six acres, uh, which are the farms that people you know, debate about. But some of them are also on larger tracts of land, legitimate farms, what I, as I would call them. And again, this just shows amongst the single family residential zones um, how, they, how they break down. So again, th this top one, R220, that's a five acre minimum lot size zone. So we have portions of the town where you have to have five acres to build one house. And then it goes down from there um, to um, three acres and two and a half acres, uh, uh, two acres, one acre, and so on. Um, and then the higher density zones are, are, are these here. Uh, and this goes to show you how much of the town is made up. So the biggest, the biggest amount is a half acre. So the most prevalent lot size in Middletown tends to be ha houses on half acre lots, which is still not small. You go to many places in New Jersey, and that would be considered a really big lot still. Um, here it's you know, medium density. Yeah. I, I just want to point out one thing, that, that when you see the, uh, the five acre uh, zoning, We've had people approach us and say, well, why don't you just make it 20-acre zoning or something where you can only put one house on that. Something like that would be challenged in court where, uh, you know, the landowner could, you know, could propose that you're unfairly devaluing his property by making it almost impossible to develop. So you have to keep the zoning within reason. Uh, you know, we could make it 100-acre zoning, and that would stop all development, but it would be challenged in court, and you would have a very tough time uh, defending that. So you have to walk the line between pushing the envelope as much as you can. And uh, the five acre zoning, if you see the areas around Cooper Road, I guess it is, and, and those areas, it, it's, w it's within the scale that you would expect for an area like that. But areas like uh, New Monmouth and, and Belford, certainly, uh, that w we would never be able to do that. So that's something to keep in mind when you see these percentages. Yeah, in fact, we did get sued over the five acre zoning at the time we created it, but we, we were able to survive that. And, and in fact, one of the really significant reasons that we can have an area that requires five acre minimum lot sizes is that um, uh, that area is unsewered. And so the absence or presence of sewer makes a big difference in what you can do from a land use, land development standpoint. You can justify legally uh, l lower density zoning 
if there's a lack of sewer uh, in the area. And that area of the township not only doesn't have sewers, it's actually prohibited from having sewers, uh, which goes back to many years to uh, when the township expanded its sewer, sewer plant, um, which you have to go to the DEP and get a lot of approvals to do. One of the conditions of that approval was that in that portion of the township, we call it the McLeese Creek Basin, um, that there cannot be sewer extensions into that area based upon that permit limitation. So that helped us um, protect it. If we didn't have that, it would probably be a lot more challengeable uh, to have five acre zoning. And this is just our multifamily zone. So again, people think of us as a predominantly single family community, and we are, but we still have a fair, oops, I'm sorry. We still have a fair amount of um, single family, I mean, excuse me, multifamily development. These are all different densities. That's why there's so many different zones. As you can see, the, the dwelling unit densities are different. Um, and again, largely the, these developments were driven by a need to provide an affordable housing um, obligations and satisfy a mandate. Um, there are some public housing projects that existed um, prior to 1980 and they're all affordable but the town gets no credit for those affordable units because the, the way the, the rules were set up is that everything has to be uh, tabulated from 1980 forward. Uh, you don't get credit for anything developed prior to 1980. Again, somewhat of an arbitrary um, standard, but that, that's what the standard has been to this point. We have, uh, this is uh, actually these dogs belong to one of our employees who was at uh, Huber Woods recently, um, another county park. Um, so how do we go about preserving open space, okay? So these are the three primary ways we do it, okay? buying a piece of land. And, uh, and as I said, we, we try to be proactive and reach out to property owners. If we hear something might be going on the market, something might be for sale, uh, we'll, we'll reach out to them. We haven't done it in recent years, as the mayor was mentioning, because we've our fund was depleted because we bought a lot. And you'll see a slide later on, which will show you how much we have actually purchased. Um, uh, but that's that's the process. And and the, in a broad sense, the, the way it works is you would approach a, a landowner they want, you know, a million dollars for their property. Uh, you're required by the process to, to get two appraisals, okay? And those two appraisals are then sent to the state, the State Green Acres Program. And the reason you, reason you participate in this is that they reimburse you 50% of the um, acquisition cost, which is, should be about the appraisal, appraisal cost. Um, and so that's a good deal, and uh, to getting 50% of your money back. Uh, so you have to do the appraisals, you come up with a, a certified value, you try to offer that to the, to the landowner. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't, sometimes they still want more. Then you have to make a decision. Are we going to pay more than the certified appraised value or are we going to say walk away? Um, and it depends. You know, we, we've done both uh, in depending on a specific situation and depending on how much more they want than the certified value. Uh, creative development techniques. We, We'll show you some slides in a minute that will show you how to do this. Even if a piece of land is going to get developed, um, there are ways to develop it that you can still preserve natural features, preserve some open space, even preserve recreation land in some cases or farmland in some cases. So not all development uh, has to completely destroy every square inch of, the, of a property. You can do it in such a way that you're preserving important pieces of it. And donations and easements, we've had property donated to us partially donated to us because the donee gets, the donor gets uh, a tax credit, can, can get a tax credit for uh, a donation of, of land. Some people have found that beneficial. Um, and getting easements on property where you're not taking property in, in fee, but you're getting the ownership uh, the owner to agree to put some limitation on their property that says they won't disturb a portion of their property, maybe forever, uh, usually forever. Um, and that devalues their property. They do that willingly, lower, also lowers their assessment, so they're kind of okay with that. And, and they're also okay knowing that this piece of their property is not going to de get developed uh, by a future owner because um, they know they, may not, they won't be there forever. So, and, and the one other thing, by the way, I should mention, I should have put it up here, but one of the other really critical factors in acquiring open space, and it's become more and more critical in the last 10, 15 years, is the issue of uh, contamination. Uh, a lot of the properties you, took, you talk about buying are farm properties. A lot of farm properties are contaminated. They have old pesticides on them. And that can be a real challenge, and that can be a deterrent to buying a piece of property because the seller doesn't want to uh, take care of the problem. It's usually expensive. 
and the town doesn't necessarily want to take on the problem because you don't necessarily know how extensive it is. You can do some preliminary work to get a sense of how significant the issue is, and sometimes if you're confident that it's an easy to solve problem, like an area has to be excavated and removed, maybe you can do that. But if it's a extensive uh, problem, if it's gotten into groundwater, and it's causing groundwater contamination that's going off site, now you're talking about millions and millions of dollars in mitigation, towns will usually not pursue a property like that. So this is a Middletown property is an open space, and, and it's, it's really hard to read. Uh, so that's why I brought a full-size one, so afterwards if people want to get a better look at it. But um, uh, this shows all of the basically preserved uh, land plus township-owned properties. Now township-owned properties could be town hall uh, or, or park, um, not parks, but uh, schools, things like that. Um, Fire Academy uh, is a township owned property, but most of them are parks. The dark green is, is county parks, the lighter green are township parks, yellow is obviously Sandy Hook. Um, and uh, you know, it gives you a sense, we have a significant amount of open space throughout the township, um, more than people realize. You know, we have such a big town that there are a lot of people who live in an area who are completely unfamiliar with the other side of town. They wouldn't know, if you told them to go to a certain street name, they wouldn't really know how to get there. That's understandable. I mean, it's a really big place. They don't necessarily go there. But I tell you what, I've taken people who live here to Ideal Beach here, and they can't even believe we have a place like that, a beach like that. It's just amazing for people. Uh, so good, good idea to get around town if you can once in a while. So these are the completed open space acquisitions that Middletown has done. And again, these, these started about... Uh, 1999, 2000 range, um, and this is just the sort of generic name for the properties, um, and 222 acres, 26 million dollars worth of open space, of which the township had to put in 10 million dollars, and we, used to, uh, as the mayor mentioned, we have about a million and a half dollars that were still uh, uh, due back to us, which we're doing some finalizing uh, on some properties to get that money back. Uh, and what happened with the state program is that um, when it first started, uh, township would get half that 50% reimbursement pretty quickly. Uh, but then as it became more and more popular, more places throughout the state throughout the state were doing it, they didn't necessarily always have the money to give you back your full 50%. Sometimes you get back a little bit less. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot of things the town has to do in order to get reimbursed. There's a lot of requirements that we have to fill. We have to do surveys, particular types of surveys. We have to do the environmental analysis to determine if it's clean. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of prep work that has to go into getting reimbursed. So it's a, it's a good program. It works really pretty well. Uh, the state has had some funding issues in the past few years that have been you know, debated in the legislature, but they seem to have a stable source of funding now. And um, like I said, we should be getting a million and a half back this year, um, and we hope to start buying some more properties this year. I don't hope to. We will. This is an example, and we have another one after this, of what we call creative development. Um, these are two side-by-side -side, uh, developments. Wood Lake Heights, this is uh, Nut Swamp Road, if you're familiar with their Shadow Lake Village right there. Middletown South is just over here somewhere. Um, this is Shady Oaks. Um, this, uh, op this yellow, these yellow uh, colored areas are open space, and what happened is uh, these lots were built, and let's just say, for example, if it was a one-acre zone, and I, I don't recall saying what it was at the time, if this is one-acre zoning where you're supposed to have one unit per acre, um, there are provisions in the rules that say, well, you can put your house on a half an acre instead of one acre, but you have to preserve what's left over. And so what happens is these homes now are surrounded by, or they surround, really nice areas of open space. In this ca case, it's a big field, um, wooded areas, wooded areas here. Um, so it's a way of preserving land that's to benefit the immediate residents who live in those homes. They, they make a choice to buy that. And this land is now deed restricted permanently, so it can really never be used for anything else, just recreation or open space. This is another one. This is a development called Chaquasset. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is uh, Kings Highway East. <coughs> And this is a presidential path. Um, this de development also encompassed this farm 
here, this landowner, this was a, a Stavola property. It encompassed this farm here, this piece of farm here, and this estate house here. Um, and it originally would have been built with, on two acre lots, gigantic houses on two acre lots. Um, and they would have been, you know, here, all, all throughout here, big giant houses with big backyards and pools and the whole bit. Um, this was done in a, a different, slightly different type of cluster development, but essentially what they did was, instead of building these big lots, they built a few extra houses, uh, to, to be honest, a few extra houses, but they built them on smaller lots and clustered them around these cul-de-sacs, and it's completely surrounded by open space, and this actually is a farm, still an active working horse farm, and so is this. And so if you drive along King's Highway East, the property looks like it's looked for the past 150 years. You don't even know this is there because there's a topographic change here. And this is probably 30 feet, 40 feet below um, King's Highway East. So driving past it, you really don't even know these houses are down here. So the, the scenic uh, corridor, if you will, was kind of preserved by doing it this way. Now, some people don't like that. Some people say, I don't like smaller houses. I like big houses. They pay a lot of money in taxes. And they do. But, you, you know, for the community sa standpoint, you'd be looking at a bunch of big houses and pools and all those sorts of improvements. Now you're looking at, at a horse farm. These are some of our other uh, parks in town, you know, different parts of the township. Again, some people might not even know they exist. Uh, this is in Port Monmouth. This is along the train tracks um, <coughs> in the Middletown Village area. Obviously, this is Belford Countryside Park is on uh, Cherry Tree Farm Road. Tyndall Park is one of our biggest and most active parks right across the street from High School North. Uh, mainly tennis courts, but it also has a basketball court and uh, a, a nice trail system back there, too. Bodman Park, another one of our most active parks. That's just their playground, but it's mainly a baseball complex um, at this point, although there are tennis courts. Um, and we actually have a, we, we had a new uh, surface put on a basketball court here that's a, a plastic uh, surface that's uh, very durable and um, very low maintenance so that those courts should last a lot longer than they have in the past. Uh, Dutch Neck is a park off of uh, Schultz Drive, <coughs> excuse me, Schultz Drive, and it overlooks the Swimming River uh, Basin. Uh, this is Ideal Beach. Th obviously, this is the playground at Ideal Beach. There's a, a big beachfront along uh, Raritan Bay. And this is the new Nut Swamp uh, turf field at, um, uh, at Nut Swamp School. And we just opened our second uh, turf field at uh, Croydon Hall. Now, I know you can't see this, and I only put this up there for kind of mass illustrative purposes, but um, one of the things that, and this is what the mayor was mentioning before about the ability to use your resources. Middletown has 49 active parks, um, and this doesn't include the school properties. 16 of the 17 schools have facilities that the township and the Board of Education both um, sort of take care of baseball fields and soccer fields and things like that. And we, we share the responsibility for lining and striping and mowing. Um, but that, those aren't on here. These are just township facilities. And so you can see we have about 48 baseball fields. We have 20-something soccer fields, uh, 46 tennis courts. I mean, we have a, a huge array of recreational facilities in the township. And this is available um, online and will be available in this presentation. We're going to put this presentation uh, on the website. Um, but this is just kind of to give a sense of exactly how many different facilities there are. And what, what the mayor was referring to is that now when we look at acquiring more open space, we have to decide, well, what are we going to do with it? Is it just going to be passive open space? Um, because if it's anything more than that, it starts to affect our resources, our ability to have enough people to cut the grass, to stripe the fields, to fix the lights, or whatever needs to be done. Um, so it's a challenge, and, and it has to be done in a thoughtful way as you're acquiring land, because you have to be able to be able to take care of it, take responsibility for it. This is um, what was known as Christmas Marina um, uh, on West Front Street in um, River Plaza. County now operate this, and there's a lot more future improvement plans for this park. It's going to be great when it's done. The county are just kind of getting into it now. There are still some issues with the property. Uh, deep Cuts, another county park. Um, and that's it in terms of the presentation. Uh, so again, the, the biggest challenge for us is um, 
not the money. I mean, the money is obviously a challenge, but the, the biggest challenge is in negotiating with property owners, trying to come to terms on a, acquiring a piece of property, and then deciding why we're acquiring it. Because you, you can imagine that there are some properties that, um, like a farm, for example, or a, uh, a large estate, and if it was purchased as open space and just allowed to grow back naturally, it wouldn't look, look very good for quite a while. And people would say, well, well that looks awful. You know, so are we going to go in and start maintaining and cutting the grass and you know, dealing with vegetation? If we do, again, that takes away from striping the fields and fertilizing the fields and all those things. So all those things have to be factored into the decision-making process when you're looking at acquiring open space. But we've done a lot of it. We will do more of it for sure. Um, and it's great to get input from the, the community when it comes to acquiring. There was a property we were looking to acquire at one time about six or seven years ago, and we were looking at making it into a small park, playground. A couple neighbors called and said, if you make that into a playground, I'm moving. They didn't want it. Uh, they'd, I'd rather have five houses there. Um, so not everyone feels the same way about parks. People, some people look at them as hangouts. Some people look at them as fun and recreation and open space. So um, there's always differing opinions on, on these things. So, that, so we always have to deal with that. I, I want to just thank everybody, uh, you know, for coming out. This is really important. I'm hoping that, you know, you'll uh, tell people that you see that, you know, the township is, is really trying to get out in front of not only development, but buying up and, you know, preserving as much as we can. Uh, I don't think anybody here wants to see another blade of grass touched. Um, but, you know, given the circumstances and, and the laws the way they are, you know, we, I think we're doing a, a fairly admirable job, uh, you know, of, of doing the best we can with you know, somewhat limited uh, resources. The good news is you know, the, uh, the county had that uh, referendum passed where they increased their, um, uh, their open space tax. Uh, the township is getting in, uh, a little bit of a war chest built up, so uh, we're going to do as much as we can you know, for the future because once that land is gone, it's gone forever. Uh, so we're you know, mindful of that and we're gonna do the best we can as far as acquiring properties that will um, pay the most bang for the buck and uh, you know hopefully be preserved for long after we're gone. Thank you very much everybody for coming.